Magenta, 69, ready, hut. Catch the ball. Welcome back into the Door Report, episode 265 on a little bit of a wet and rainy Tuesday, March 26th, 2024. I am Will Byram, joined as always, and you're a little off kilter if you want to adjust the uh, camera here. I am Will Byram, joined as always on our elaborate setup by my co-host, Trevor Hewlin, aka Hack Squat Jim Duggan. Trevor, a lot to talk about but not a lot to talk about at the same time on episode 265. But before we get into all that, I need to mention we are sponsored by 615 Collectibles. If you're into sports cards or sports memorabilia of any kind, check out 615 Collectibles on eBay. Shipping is always fast and free. Website coming soon to summer of 2024, 615collectibles.com. A little update on the 615 Collectibles website, uh, which is my sports card sports memorabilia site. I transferred the domain. I, I did have it set up on Squarespace. Transferred the domain to Shopify. I now realize I like Squarespace much better than Shopify. Oh, really? Yeah, Shopify's... Ca- unless I, I, I might have to dig in and figure it out, but the category system on Shopify is funky. And I've got to figure that out because it needs to be personalized to sort sports cars. But that's beyond the point. Uh, look for that website coming soon. Hopefully, summer of 2024. But my calendar is booked between my day job and the door report with a lot of news coming around Vanderbilt athletics, probably going to be slowing down at some point pretty soon. You'd yeah. think, but here on episode 265, Trevor, we have a little bit of Vandy boys action. I'm sure that's what everybody's tuning in to hear about is the sweep over the weekend. Yeah. How we got our brains beat in. Not good from sweeper to sweepy, but the main beef of this episode of episode 265, the Vanderbilt Commodores have their head coaches, Phoebe, has hopped into frame, if you're watching the video on YouTube. An unusual spot, to be a honest. New, a brand new spot. Is she going to jump? Here, let's see if she jumps. This is good podcasting. Good podcasting. We can keep going. I'm just going right. to I'm just gonna be coaxing Phoebe over to jump. We'll I'll give you a heads up if she launches. We'll see if Phoebe decides to join us on the table or decides to stay in the background. CGI cat, Phoebe. But the Vanderbilt Commodores have a new head basketball coach. Vanderbilt has hired, drum roll please, Trevor, Mark Byington. Who? (laughs) Just playing. (laughs) Just kidding. That was just playing. (laughs) A little bit of our reaction at the beginning. Uh, But as we've done a little more research, given it a little bit more thought, we'll get into our reaction on that hire. But I think the overall sentiment is very positive. I've completely changed my tune as of, yesterday morning yeah i i think i have as well you were initially a little bit more knee-jerk negative but i was also knee-jerk meh on, yeah on the higher i was i'm initially knee-jerk i was super bummed and we'll get into that but i was very bummed initially and some of that was because of competition whatever most of that had to do with last episode if you tuned into episode 264 me and trevor ran through 10 or 11 names Lots of dudes. Pretty in-depth on these guys, their resumes, how they would kind of fit, and we ranked our top three, top four. Mark Byington was not on that list. No. He was on nobody's list. That that higher, well, he was obviously on Vanderbilt's list, but nobody, no insider's list no. of any kind. Kind of came out of left field here, but a great hire nonetheless, I mm-hmm. think, after digging into it. We'll give our reasons, or my reasons at least, as to why I think that. But before we get into all that and much more, don't forget to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Door Report. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our podcast is available on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and Google Podcasts. And while you're at it, give our podcast five stars and a review on iTunes. It's now time for segment one. Welcome back into episode 265, segment one here. To start out, Trevor, we have to talk a little baseball. And then we'll get into the beef. I mentioned it in the intro. Vandy boys went from sweeper to sweepy. Swept number 18 Auburn, first SEC uh, SEC series of the year. Went on to then 
be swept by unranked South Carolina on the road, mm-hmm. moving the Vanderbilt Commodores to 19 and six on the season. Now 20 and six after they just beat Valparaiso in a midweek game, three to two. Just finished watching that before we started recording. But it moved Vanderbilt back in the rankings to number seven, moved them well back in the SEC standings as well. Trevor, what are your evaluations of what you saw this weekend? Um, first off, the I would say the lone bright spot, probably not the lone. I'm being hypercritical. Um, Carter Holton pitched a phenomenal game. He continues to show why he's the ace, why he's the stud of this rotation. Whoa. That scared me. Phoebe just jumped on the table for those listening. Yeah, that startled me. Welcome to the pod, Phoebe. Yeah, struck out 10 guys uh, in his appearance. He continues to look wonderful. Um, But I think the real story over the weekend was the bats just were very iffy. uh, And just dumb, dumb plays uh, of error against, I believe it was the Saturday game. Um, Either Saturday or Sunday, but I believe the Saturday game. Just ball should have been a routine fly ball, drops. South Carolina ends up putting up four runs in the frame. Um, really did Vanderbilt end. The bats just didn't have the juice to come back. Um, and so, yeah, very, very tough. Uh, bullpen continues to be a little sketchy. Um, I get a lot of those guys are young, but still, man, really, really sketchy. Um, I Also, to looking at my notes, I don't believe we saw Braden Holcomb at all this weekend. I'm going to level with you. I was watching college basketball the entire weekend, so I I did not catch any of the games in actual live time. But just to add a little bit of context for everybody out there, Vanderbilt and South Carolina did not have a game on Friday night due to to weather. Due to weather, yep. There was then a doubleheader on Saturday. Vanderbilt lost the first of that doubleheader 4-8. to Lost the second half of that doubleheader 3-8, to and then lost the final game of the series. 10-2. Ten to two, so the pitching wasn't great, but the bats. What happened to the bats? I don't know. Put it, up single digit runs for an entire weekend. Total, total it, single digit runs. Nine total runs. And this is what I'm starting. I'm starting to think. I was really. I've been really, really praising the bats. I think the bats can be good. I'm looking at this team ranking right now. I know batting average in terms of Major League Baseball isn't a thing. You want um, OPS. Uh, But Vanderbilt's team batting average right now is 307. If you're a Major League Baseball player hitting 307, you're going to be a perennial all-star. Batting 307 as a team, especially in college baseball, that leaves a little bit of room for concern for me, man. That's not that high. Um a 300 batting average as a team in college baseball just is not that good. Um, fourth in the SEC, 39th in D1. It really, really, really um, makes me pause a little bit. But then again, for doubles, they're second in the SEC with 57, 20th uh, in all of Division I. Um, hits 261, third in the SEC, 25th in D1. <sighs> that batting average really, it makes it makes me think that they're scared to hit. Not scared to hit. It makes me think that, and I think this is what we've all thought uh, even going into this season, and really this is what we've seen so far in this season, is this isn't going to be a power team. So far they have showed no power. Can they hit the gaps? Yes. I think the idea whenever they are going up to the plate is get on base by any means necessary. Hits, walks, bunts, do whatever you can, and just play small ball on the base paths. I love that type of play. I think that's how Tim Corbin made his money all those years. That's his bread and butter. I don't know if that's going to win you meaningful college baseball games anymore. We're for the first time, actually, we have enough quality games to evaluate some problems on this roster. I think the bats, there have been some people on Twitter that have correctly called it out. The bats may be a problem Mm -hmm. this year. That's not saying the pitching is not going to be a problem also. And you're also complaining about a team that's 19 and six and might have just had an off weekend with possible a, with a weird schedule uh, going on with the game on Friday canceled doubleheader, the momentum of that first game translating to the second game that can happen. But overall, a huge series this weekend at home against Missouri, mm-hmm. an awesome. unranked Missouri team. You have to come out and win the series. I, I think that's a good goal to bounce back. You can't lose the series to Missouri here. Get yourself back on track for the rest of this long SEC season. This series starts on Thursday. Is that correct? 
Uh, I have. Yes. I Thursday. hate those types of That's series. Weird. I wish it was a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I believe we played Missouri Thursday, Friday, Saturday last year. And I just want to go on the record. I hate when series start on Thursdays. But I just want to point out as well that you have to get right with this Missouri series because you are on the road against number eight LSU the following weekend. And that's a brutal matchup, especially if you lose two series in a row, one of them being swept against two unranked opponents. How awesome would it be to see this team just absolutely tee off on Christian Little? It would be poetic. It would be poetic. Hopefully the bats can get back on track. Anything else you want to add on baseball before we hit the TDR cocktail break and discuss the beef of this episode and buy in to Mark Byington. Yeah, just a brief little thing. I spoke on this in one episode, the most recent episode that actually got lost, that which was a banger episode. Um, I know it was a road series, so they didn't wear the Sunday greens. I will go on record and say we need to get rid of the Sunday greens. I know they play a home series this weekend. I'm hoping since it's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday game, they won't wear the greens on Saturday. Uh, but still, I do want to go on record and say I support the troops. God bless America. Bring the boys home. Um, I hate those uniforms. They're so ugly. Please stop wearing them. This is a hill Trevor is willing to die on, no matter the amount of hate he gets for this opinion. I don't get how people can look at them and say, those are gorgeous. They're ugly as hell. I don't go as far as ugly as hell. They're not my favorite. They are not my favorite. Are they your least favorite? They might be. <laughs> they, I, they might be my least favorite. I don't hate them, but they might be my least favorite. You might be onto something there, Trevor. I do want to say if I sound low energy, I'm going to be 100% honest. I am tired. I am very tired right now. So we are powering through on episode 265. Next up, we have discussion about Vanderbilt's new head coaching hire. Oh, do we want to mention the women? We almost forgot. The Lady Doors. The Lady Doors won their play-in game, their first round game, quote unquote, of the SEC tournament, beating Columbia. 72 to 68. Shout out Shay Ralph. Won me 50 bucks. Shout out Shay Ralph. I watch every game. Did you watch Vanderbilt's next game against Baylor? I'm just going to be honest, guys. I haven't watched a single Vanderbilt Lady Doors you were, game. All you year. were supposed to be our women's basketball aficionado, and you failed. Once again, so bad. once again, my Twitter gets me in trouble. I did watch. <laughs> I did watch the Vanderbilt Columbia game. Great performance from the ladies. Ayana Moore was a stud. Ayana Moore. We tweeted it. I didn't get to catch much of the Baylor Vanderbilt game. I didn't catch any of it, but the doors lost 80 to 63. But shout out to Shay Ralph for getting the girls to the tournament, winning their play in game, and actually participating in the big dance. So that's a big step forward for the program. Had to shout out the Lady Doors coined here on TDR. But Trevor, let's hit the TDR cocktail break. Grab yourself a cold one and let's discuss Vanderbilt's new head coaching hire. Welcome back <laughs> from the your TDR cocktail break. Phoebe has taken an interesting position, just her back half in the screen. So great optics here. Great camera work. No class or dignity from Phoebe. None at all. None at all. Cover yourself up, Phoebe. But speaking of no class and dignity, Trevor, we took a shot, I believe. <laughs> we took a shot last week. Transition. On God. The, I mean. Just off the dome, tired from work, doesn't matter. We took a shot last week when we did the podcast discussing the firing of Jerry Stackhouse. I poured us up a couple shots of Four Roses. It's time to take a shot. The Vanderbilt Commodores have their new head coach. Salud, brother. Delicious. I'm starting to turn into a bourbon guy, I think. I'm turning into the right way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What are we going to talk about here? I Let's... think people should be really impressed with how easy we down those shots. I, I think they should. Also, speaking of taking shots, I was at a house party Saturday for people I didn't know. They were really mm. sweet, though. My girlfriend knew them from the gym. It was like a housewarming party. And they're giving around shooters to all the girls. And they're like, oh, cheers. And 
they all cheer and it's just like a little like pomegranate shooter. My girl downs it, doesn't like that looks unfazed, and all the other girls like only took a sip and they're like, oh, and everybody's looking at her, and I'm like, that's my girl, baby. Hey, the pride. Yeah, that's my girl. The pride <laughs> in your eyes. I felt so proud. I was like, yes. <laughs> what number head coach is this for Vanderbilt in Vanderbilt's history? That's what I've been trying to look. 29th coach in program history, according to Miller McKee. I, I'm reading his article that he wrote. I'm sure you on, can find that on Wikipedia. Yeah, posted on the doorreport.com. Go check it out. Out with the old, in with the new. Vanderbilt hires Mark Byington. And in there, he says, the 29th coach in program history. So I'm going to trust Miller because we have no fact-checking team <laughs> at all. That's our fact-checking yes, team is this, the back half of the cat sitting yes. here. But Trevor, I think let's start with mine because I need to walk back a couple tweets that yeah. I that I initially put out. And I believe you have something similar yeah, that you'd I, probably yeah, like yeah, to whenever say. You get your, whenever you do your walk back, I'll swing it over to me and I'll do my walk back. So I walked it back with a tweet already. But I want to read my tweets directly. The first tweet was quoting John Rothstein, who's the first person that I saw break the news that Vanderbilt was closing in on hiring Mark Byington from James Madison. I said, a very okay hire. And then I quoted the Door Report tweet, also reporting that, and said, after some of the names floated during the search, feels very meh. After doing a little bit more research that we'll get into on the rest of this episode, a little bit more thinking, emotions a little bit lowered, just using my brain more than my heart, I said, after more research and time to think, the doors might be back. And I think that's kind of the conclusion you also came to after doing a little bit more research, listening to some people talk about uh, Byington. So are you on the Byington train before we hop into why I have hopped on the Byington train? Yeah, I tweeted initially whenever they announced it. I believe I quoted the John Rostein tweet, and I said, super disappointing. Uh, a lot of people are very upset with me. Uh, I even tweeted I'm just, something along the lines of, I'm just back to not caring. Um, got into a couple of uh, Twitter engagements with people to where I'm like, this is just a super disappointing hire considering the names that were floated. Um, as well. After doing more research, watching some film, uh, I would like to walk those back. I did tweet that I am a Byington stan now. Uh, I don't want to say this because he hasn't even done his presser yet. He might be the guy. I like him a lot now. Before I forget to say this, the presser is Thursday at 4 p.m. Open to fans. That's awesome. Too. Where is it located? I have no. I think Memorial. Uh, let me look that up. Try. Try. I'll to be watching this. the. I'll be watching the Cincinnati Reds opening day against the Washington Nationals. Uh, if that was not going on, I would totally be there. Um, even though I have class at 5 p.m., I would totally be there. I think that's awesome. They're opening it up to the public, uh, not just press, but fans as well. And we talked about this before. I think this shows that Vanderbilt is very cognizant of, I don't know how they couldn't be cognizant of it, of how the fans felt during the Jerry Stackhouse tenure, especially at the tail end, feeling as though we were always disrespected because we were and always looked down upon. I think this is them trying to usher in a new era and maybe some sort of weird apology to where they're saying, hey, we realize what just went down. We realize it did a disservice to you guys, that you guys were very unhappy. So we would like to open this up to you guys as well so that you can see that, hey, there really is a new leaf. Maybe we are turning a corner. Maybe we are changing our attitude. But we want to show you that there's this new guy and that things are going to change around here. So obviously we have not spoken to Mark Byington. He's probably not going to join TDR. We're going to try. We I would thought, love to have him on. I, I have sent an email, one email. I'll probably follow up tomorrow. Um, two people within Vanderbilt Athletic Comms trying to get him on the podcast. I would love to have him on the podcast. I really would just like to pick his brain. And I think, too. It would be a great way to endear himself to the fans. We don't have a big platform. Like a ton of people don't listen to us, but still to go to come on this podcast, I think that would do really, really well for fans to show, hey, just this guy's down with the crowd. Just to show the engagement with fans. Yeah. Because the last tenure, the last five years have been the exact opposite mm -hmm. of engaging the fans, engaging the quote unquote sidewalk fans. 
they've been pushed away. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think after what I've read and listened to about Mark Byington that that is going to be the case with him. I don't think he's a big golfer. No. I don't think that's going to be an issue. And I also wanted to mention before I forgot it, forgot to mention it, there is a great podcast put up by VandySports.com. It was Joey Dwyer with Chris Dorch of, what is it, the Blue Ribbon? I believe so. Basketball yearbook or yes. something. I don't want to misquote it, but Chris Dorch knows Mark Byington in some capacity, has been following his career for a long time, had great things to say about Mark Byington, and a lot of other things we have read have been associated with him being a very hardworking coach, one of the hardest working coaches in the country. Mm -hmm. And that is what Vanderbilt fans desperately want. Mm -hmm. It's just a coach that's hobby is coaching college basketball. Yeah, absolutely. It's his job and his hobby. And Vanderbilt hasn't had that. Mm -hmm. So just having a guy engaged with actual college basketball previous coaching experience is yeah. going to be nice. Who would think that that would be a big thing? That might be a little important, but let me run through Mark Byington's resume just to make sure everyone out there is familiar with it. Before you do that, I do want to preface to anybody from Vanderbilt listening to possibly mewing over the idea of letting Coach Byington on this pod. I promise we will not be dickheads. We'll be on our best behavior. It'll be very professional. We really would like to have him on the pod. We won't goof off or anything like that. No, so we'll goof off. We will goof off. In a positive way. In a positive, but we will not, we will not do anything bad. We promise. And Mark, this will be a fun interview. Yeah. If you're involved, there's not going to be high pressure questions. This will be a fun interview, a get to know the new coach type of interview, exactly. a little bit different than I think you would you would have with the Tennessee and yeah. or with VandySports.com or with Vandy 24 seven. Like I want to ask him what his Wendy's order is. Or yeah. Something like that. And it, and if joining the podcast is out of the question, stop by lot two during football oh, season oh and you will be God. greeted with open arms. Everybody would love to see you stop by. Yeah, absolutely. But that's shooting, shooting in the door, shooting for the moon there. But Mark Byington's resume played at UNC Wilmington from 1994 to 1998, I believe scored 1,088 career points. Do not quote me on that. That is not pulled up in front of me. Uh, <laughs> that's just, I don't know why that number's in my head. That could be so wrong. I wish I wouldn't have said that. But <laughs> I don't even know where I saw that. If that, that number just look, popped in your look head. Look that up and see Hold if on. you can find his career score. Because if I'm right, I'm kind of because I thought I read it on his Wikipedia page, but I don't see it here. I'm Whatever. It All right. So now we're getting into his coaching career. Was an assistant coach at the College of Charleston from 2002 to 2004. Was an assistant coach at Virginia from 2004 to 2005. Big deal to me, having high major assistant experience. Then went on to be, I'm assuming, a higher level assistant coach at the College of Charleston, again, from 2005 to 2012. Went on to be the interim head coach to close out, I'm assuming, the 2012 season at the College of Charleston. That's correct. 1,088. 1, 1, oh. That's correct. That's impressive. Per sportsreference.com, that is correct. I need you to look at what I was looking at so you know I didn't read this off of yeah, what Yeah, this I'm is nowhere. At. No idea why I remembered that. So maybe my brain is working. It only says more than a thousand. Yeah. You just pulled out the 88. Don't know where I it got it. It could have been 1,999. But after serving as the interim head coach at College of Charleston, went on to be an assistant at Virginia Tech. Very familiar with the Southeast area, you would assume. And then got his first head coaching gig, permanent head coaching gig at Georgia Southern. Not a perennial power in college basketball. To state it lightly, not a perennial power. Then went on to take the James Madison job from 2020 to 2024. And then, of course, took the Vanderbilt job. So correct me if I'm wrong. 2013 was Georgia Southern's first year ever as a basketball program. I don't think that's right there. I Because I remember them playing Tennessee in the early 2010s and them saying something along the lines of this is one of the first football teams they've ever had. I think in terms of athletics, they're a relatively young university. I don't think that's right. They've probably been they have stats. I... They have stats all the way back on Ken Palm from 1997. Okay, so we'll probably we'll, we'll, <laughs> we're not we'll, going to edit it. We'll cut that. We'll cut that. There's no cutting here. We'll cut that. If you're wrong, you're wrong. We'll all cut right. That. But started out at Georgia Southern. Just to add a little bit of context, Georgia Southern, even though they have had a program, not a traditionally successful 
program. The four years prior to Mark Byington becoming the head coach, so from 2010 to 2013, Georgia Southern finished to in Ken Palm 300th, 328th, 246th, and 282nd with records of 9 and 23, 5 and 27, 15 and 15, and 14 and 19. Mark Byington comes in, first year, obviously rebuilding, finished 291st in Ken Palm, go 15 and 19. Then an upward trajectory, basically, of success from that point on, finished 147th the following year, going 22 and 9, then finished 210th, I believe, going 14 and 17, then finished 195th, going 18 and 15, finished 192nd, going 21 and 12, finished number 103. Uh, going 21 and 12, and I believe winning their regular season conference championship. Could be wrong on that. And then going 20 and 13, 134th in Ken Palm in 2020 to close out his career before he went on to James Madison. So much better success once he got to Georgia Southern versus what they had done previously. Then Brian Bird came in as the head coach right after Byington left and immediately back to mediocrity. Finished 270th in the Ken Palm. 253rd and 209th. And then this past season finished 280th with a record of nine and 24 with a different coach named Charlie Henry. So Byington comes in, the program does better. Byington leaves and the program does worse. Yeah. That's about as simple as you, as you can make it at his previous stop at Georgia Southern. Yeah. Good sign. Good sign for coach. Good sign for coach. Then moves on to James Madison in the CAA initially when he got there. Then moved back to the Sun Belt Conference, which he just left Mm -hmm. at Georgia Southern. Uh, Let me pull up, if I can find it, James Madison's success history. So prior to Mark Byington coming over here, Lewis Rowe was the head coach. Took over from Matt Brady, who finished 91st in Ken Palm whenever he left. Actually, very impressive. Lewis Rowe took over. I believe Matt Brady went on to Drexel. I could be wrong about that. I could be wrong about a lot of things in this episode. We're just shooting from the hip Shooting tonight. from the absolute hip. But Lewis Rowe finished the four years prior to Byington coming there, finished 223rd in Ken Palm, 229th in Ken Palm, 285th in Ken Palm, and in 2020 finished 311th in Ken Palm with a final record of 9-21 and for James Madison before he was let go. Mark Byington comes in. Shortened season in 2021, finished 177th, 13 and 7 overall. The following season, finished 227th, finishing 15 and 14. Then moved over to the Sun Belt. In 2023, they finished top 100 in Ken Palm, 98th in the country, with a record of 22 and 11. And then, of course, this past year, we're more familiar with it, finished 62nd in Ken Palm. 32 and four, I believe the quickest team in the country to 30 wins this last season, multiple times ranked in the top 25. Big win over Wisconsin in the round of 62 as well. And then round of 64. 64, sorry. That shot's already got you going. One shot and Trevor Slur and his words of forgetting how many teams are in the tournament. And then I and then I just make up a random statistic that Georgia Southern started playing college basketball in 2013. Well, they could have been in a different conference. (laughs) I, I don't know about enough about the history of Georgia Southern. I think it was definitely you. they had a brand new football team, but they probably been playing basketball for a while. That probably could be true. I have no idea. Maybe they change conferences. Who knows? Georgia Southern. Opponent to Vanderbilt football this year. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. We play in Atlanta. Thanks, Derek Mason. That's Georgia State. Georgia. I'm thinking of Georgia State. That's a different. I take it back. I was thinking of Georgia State the entire time. That's my I retract problem. my statement. It is the whiskey. It's the whiskey scotch. It is. The, it's the whiskey mixed with the Zen, mixed with the Diet Coke, all over the place. So that's enough of boring numbers and stats. The gist of it, mm-hmm. to sum it up, where Mark Byington goes, the program gets better. Yeah. When he leaves, the program tends to get worse. Mm-hmm. That's about the gist of it. Now, his actual coaching style. I don't think he's the -the over-the-top personality based on what I've seen. He's not a Kevin Stallings, Chris Mack, yell at the referees, 
tell a player he's going to fucking kill him. That's yeah. not Mark Byington. That's what I wanted. Which but. is kind of, it is kind of what we wanted. It was an adjustment to get our minds away from Chris Mack and Dusty May. Mm-hmm. Those were the two names that kept rattling around that would have been gigantic splash hires that garnered national attention. Mm-hmm. The moment it went away from those two names, it was hard to not go, eh. Yeah, like, yeah you know, I agree. Now looking at it logically, and after reviewing his coaching style, it's going to be a whole new world for Vanderbilt fans mm-hmm. compared to what they've seen from Jerry Stackhouse. Phoebe's making an appearance again, very active today. Yeah, her, her head was popped up and she was just totally blocking me. <laughs> but to remind Vanderbilt fans of how horrible, we all watched it. Yeah. So you saw what Jerry Stackhouse's style was, very slow, not a lot of transition offense. A lot of sets, a lot of boring ISO ball that just seemed to be chucking up a shot you could get up late in the shot Mm -hmm, clock. Absolutely. Vanderbilt was 285th in the country in tempo. Compare that to James Madison, which I'm going to struggle to switch back and forth between screens on this glitchy laptop. But James Madison was 69th in the country in tempo. And when you actually look at some of the quick film from James Madison, obviously haven't done a gigantic evaluation. They're looking for the first good shot available. Mm -hmm. A lot of turning defense into offense, a lot of aggressive defense into transition, quick threes, Mm -hmm. guys that have the green light are allowed to shoot, a much more open and flowing style of basketball. And just to point out one stat, I don't want to get too caught up in stats because they're not super comparable between competition. But in three-point percentage on offense, James Madison last year shot 36% from three, 60th in the country. And on defense, this is the thing I want to emphasize. Mm -hmm. I like his offense, but on defense, James Madison finished fourth in the country in opponent three-point field goal shooting percentage. Some of that could be competition, but a lot of that is knowing how to defend the three-point line. Mm -hmm. Opponent shot 29.7% against James Madison from three last year. Compare that to what Vanderbilt did. And my God, you could not get a more different opposite side of the spectrum. Vanderbilt as a team shot 28.3% from three last year, 355th in the country. Defending it, they were almost just as bad. Opponent shot 37.4% from three against Vanderbilt, 349th in the country. Everything that you disliked about Vanderbilt basketball underneath Jerry Stackhouse is going to be different underneath Mark Byington. Absolutely. That is what got me bought in. The average possession length on offense for James Madison, 16.6 seconds, 67th in the country. The average possession length for Vanderbilt, 19 seconds, 332nd in the country. It is a lot more up-tempo, fun pace, fun basketball to watch, worst case. And he knows how to recruit shooters and guys that can score. And that's that's what got me on board. I was like we said, I was very, I was disappointed in the hire, and a lot of people, including national media, everybody said, "Wow, this is a sensational hire for Vanderbilt." So then that kind of got me thinking. Okay, let me look into it a little bit. I found a couple of videos on YouTube breaking down. It was uh, one was a James Madison uh, basketball. Highlight reel from this year, of course, can't garner much from highlights. Another was an offensive breakdown on the style of basketball that James Madison runs. Those videos are what got me going. Watching James Madison's offense, like you highlighted, in transition, a great shooting team, aggressive on offense, really, really, really turned me in uh, to a Mark Byington fan. I watched the videos, and I watched a couple of possessions. And and I counted. Uh, and then again, I know this is this isn't uh, in a good indicator of modern college basketball. Um, but growing up, my dad was always like John Wooden, always taught pass the ball five times before you take a shot. A lot of their guys didn't, but man, I saw some great offensive possessions to where I go one pass, two pass, three pass, four pass, five pass, six pass, shot. Some pass, some offensive possessions, I just saw one or two passes in the shot. Some offensive possessions, dudes are just straight going to the hoop or just stopping to the three-point line and jacking up threes. I love that. They're a fast-paced team. They're a fun basketball team on offense, and that is some basketball that looks flowy, great off-ball movement. I'm very, very excited uh, for what this offense could be. There's one YouTube video I want to shout out. It's from the account Basketball Immersion. 
and the title of it is James Madison and Mark Byington's fast-paced basketball offense. Really good video, about 10 minutes long, had, points out what their goal is on the transition offense, points out what they're doing on defense to get into their transition offense. A great video. Also, something I like to do during the week when scouting during the football season is I like to see what opposing po fan podcasts are talking about mm -hmm. and evaluating really any decision. I think looking at what fans are saying, if fans are a little bit happy in any way about a coach leaving bad sign, mm -hmm. yeah. JMU fans were not happy about Mark Byington leaving at all. They were very solemn saying, Oh, another time, a high major pillaging a mid major program. Mm -hmm. They were not happy about it. Now, Byington did sign a contract extension prior to the Sunbelt tournament that increased his buyout from 500K to a million dollars because I think Byington knew what was happening, yeah. wanted to set JMU up well. They don't have the cash flowing in the same way that even Vanderbilt does yeah. in the SEC. But that video on YouTube in particular was, was great, the basketball immersion video. So anybody that's on the fence about Mark Byington specifically – Go watch that video. I promise you will at least get a little bit of hope into your eyes. What what it reminded me of, and I'm not a big NBA fan, but I do love sports history. It Watching this JMU offense reminded me a lot of those early Magic Johnson teams pre-Pat Riley um, to where they would just go in and their goal was, hey, run, 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 up and down, fast-paced offense. And their theory was the more shots you can get up, Odds are the more points you are going to score. So they would go pass, shoot, don't pass, shoot. Just get shots up, let shots fall. It sort of reminds me of that style of offense where they're like, hey, we're just going to run you up and down the court and whoever's standing wins. Yeah, one of the quotes I liked, and it's not directly related to like the X's and O's, uh, but from that podcast from VandySports.com where Joey Dwyer was uh, talking with Chris Dorch, Chris Dorch had the quote of, He's Dusty May without the Final Four run. And that kind of set it different in my eyes when I looked at the resumes, looked at their accomplishments, similar ages. Byington's 47 years old, I believe. Young. Right in the prime of where you want to pick him up. Um, that's that's pretty much what it is. I mean, I don't want to keep beating and do it. We don't know if he's going to be successful, mm -hmm. but he has all the signs that he can be yeah because at this point i mean i i did like some of the i dis yeah let me let me start over i did not like i don't want to say what i was about to say i don't no. want to spend a negative light on no it. say it let it ride there were some people that were talking about vanderbilt fans having a negative reaction or a slightly mad reaction to him saying Vanderbilt fans just don't understand. You're not just going to go pick up UCLA's head coach. And I'm like, that's not really what we were saying. No. It's just the other names that had been floated are a little more exciting. Yeah. But I think once you really break everything down, Byington, probably the safe, yeah. good hire. In also, situation. sorry, nobody wants Mick Cronin anymore, by yeah, the way. Yeah, that was a very weird one. I think we're referencing the exact same yeah. thing here. Um, I saw that. that I was like, why would I want Mick Cronin? But there is one player from JMU to keep an eye on, Ooh, maybe more than one. I wanted to talk about this. Uh, this is, is there anything else you want to add about Byington here? I mean, just to reiterate, I take back what I said. I'm all on the Byington train. Buy stock in Byington. Buy stock in Byington. But there's one player. There will probably be more. But the main guy from this JMU roster underneath Byington is Terrence Edwards Jr. Sunbelt Player of the Year. Six foot six junior averaged 17.2 points per game last season. He has entered his name into the transfer portal and also will declare for the NBA draft. So this reminds me a bit of the Tyron Lawrence situation. Of course. If Terrence Edward Jr. comes back and does not go to the NBA, I think that's a guy that follows Byington to Vanderbilt. I and agree. that would immediately be Vanderbilt's best player. Oh my word. So yes. that would that would set this rebuild up to be more of a reload than a rebuild, that's going to be a massive domino that could fall and something to keep an eye on during this during this process. I think, too, I think if you could get him, and I, obviously he's going to have to hit the portal hard, and once again, there have been murmurs that Vanderbilt has an NIL war chest and basketball ready to reload. 
Um, and so that has me really, really excited. If you could get him, you obviously have Van Lubin coming back. I think that's a huge addition. Um, if you could get that kid, you got Van Lubin coming back. Uh, two or three other guys, I'm feeling dangerous. This is so with we talked about this during the break. This will be kind of the the last comparison I want to draw. This this we'll see if this strings together makes any sense. With Bryce Drew coming in, there were concerns that his ex's nose wouldn't carry over. He was known as a great recruiter, was going to bring in this incredible class into Vanderbilt and a different mindset into recruiting. He did that. His ex's nose and offensive defense and his whole style just did not transition to the high major level. Then you go with a guy like Jerry Stackhouse, known only for his X's and O's, zero recruiting experience and zero talent evaluation experience. Comes in, that was very apparent. Even though I've said multiple times, I still don't understand why he was so revered for his X's and O's. It's too complicated for college basketball. I It might be, but he was not good at evaluating talent and getting no. the right pieces in. Byington is... He does have college coaching experience. I think his system and offense and defense will work at Vanderbilt. I, I don't want to confuse things. He's not one of these top 10 in the country. Push, 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 shoot the ball, shoot the ball. That's not buying him, but he does play at a faster pace. The real question with him is, can he recruit with the big boys? Yeah. It's way less about finding these diamonds in the rough like it is at JMU. It's less about finding the diamonds in the rough. And can you convince these top tier recruits and top tier transfer portal guys that they need to be at Vanderbilt and you're the guy to allow them to take the next step to becoming that next next level player can buying to do that even with a reported NIL war chest that's the question mark with them that's why I think we were both so high on Chris Mack oh absolutely is the Mack stuff is what was questions of character program yeah. operation but the man has the X's and O's, and he's done it at a high level, recruiting at a high level consistently. Yeah. So that's the question with Byington. Can you buy a team? That's Vanderbilt's going to try. We're going to find Can out. Can you buy a basketball roster? Hmm. If you had to bet on it right now, let's talk about this to close it out. Okay. What are your expectations slash timeline of expectations for Byington? Ooh, the that's a tough was a question. Good question. So what are my expectations of them in my timeline? I would like... Well, just like year one, year two, year three, where are like the benchmarks of success? Year one, he should have a winning record. What that winning record is, I don't know. He should have a winning record. Maybe not in conference, but overall, I think he should have a winning record. Probably, if I'm going to play it safe, I'll say not a tournament team but a team that looks really fun. Does that make sense in year one? You've got higher expectations than me. Oh, really? Year one. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. Okay, so that's my year one. Year two, if you got some guys that are you, that you know are coming back, if the NIL war chest still has money in it, year two, I would love to be a bubble team. I would love to be a bubble team. And by bubble team, I mean... We are watching Selection Sunday with bated breath. Sort of like Jerry Stackhouse the year before last, if that makes sense. How they had that run in the SEC tournament. We're watching Selection Sunday like, are we going to do it? Year three, 110% should be a tournament team. Winning record in conference, obviously winning record out of conference, should be a tournament team. What seed? I don't know. I would be happy with an eight or a nine. Hell, I would be happy if we played a play-in game, to be honest with you. But just getting in the tournament, I think, should be the goal by year three. I agree with that timeline. How I think of it is a little more like baseline mm -hmm. expectations I have, which are like, this is the minimum point you okay. need to be at. So I think year one, I think, is hitting 12 plus, 13 plus total wins. That would put and, them at, like, what, 13, 15? Yeah, 13 yeah. to 15 wins, win five, six, seven games in conference. Okay. You know, if they won four or five games, had a even if they had a similar year to this year, it's not panic mode for me at all. Okay. So, but I do have higher expectations than that as a fan. But as far as, like, being upset, 
you're rebuilding an entire roster yeah. here. I mean, truly, the the cabinet is bare. Mm-hmm. What has been left for you at, on this Vanderbilt roster? Every piece of talent outside of Van Allen Lubin is either gone or transferring. Mm-hmm. So that's a tough place to start. You're literally trying to do something unprecedented, mm-hmm. which is just build a basketball team through the transfer portal. No matter how much money you have, that's going to be tough. Mm-hmm. So year one, Almost, I'm going to be excited. I'm going to be in Memorial. I'm going to be watching every game just to see what they can build. But the expectations and the evaluation, I can't really make it during year one, but five plus SEC wins. Okay. 12, 12, 13 plus overall wins. Nothing crazy. Year two, I don't know if I put it as high as saying I want to be watching Selection Sunday with bated breath, Mm -hmm. but I want this team to not be in the dregs of the SEC. Yeah. You know, not even necessarily middle of the pack, but fighting to not be in the first four, the the two play-in games of the SEC tournament, mm-hmm. sitting around ninth, 10th. Now that there's going to be 16 teams in the conference, I don't know how the actual SEC tournament's going to play out. I probably should know that. Do we know that? I don't know that. I don't think that's public info yet. But whatever it is, you know, some more wins moving in the right direction. Year three, I think, is what you're saying year two for me. Is I want oh, to I okay. want to be a bubble team. Min, oh, min this is minimum. This okay. is minimum. This is like to not have me like year four is a hot seat. Okay. They've got to be a bubble team. They got to be middle of the pack in the SEC, close to 20 wins overall, moving in the right direction. Now, year four is the year you have to make a tournament this year or have made a tournament in the previous three seasons. That's year four for me. Okay. I, I that would give a full cycle of recruiting. I just think it's being undervalued, even though the transfer portal is so popular. It's being undervalued how little talent Vanderbilt has right now. Yeah. I'll ask you this. if, And this is going to be a tough question to ask as well. If he goes into the portal and let's say he gets a top 10 portal class, does that change your expectations for year one? He gets a top 10 portal class, boom, without even putting together, uh, uh, having a game under his belt. I think it's hard to say, like, expectations, because obviously I would love to have Byington come in and make a tournament year one Mm -hmm. and just bring in a top 10 transfer class and have him win. I think I'm looking at it more from, like, a reasonable progression spot. Oh, definitely. I think Byington can do that, Mm -hmm. can bring in an incredible class, can turn the program around, but we have to keep in mind how bad it's been for the most part yeah. of the last five years, had a good little bit of a good stretch in year four for Jerry Stackhouse. But other than that, it's been abysmal. Mm-hmm. It has You're been. no longer sitting there saying, ah, oh, we're a middle of the pack SEC team. We just need a coach that can take us to the next level. Mm-hmm. You're now bottom of the barrel. Yeah. And you've got to build up from being the cellar dweller mm-hmm. in the SEC. It's a new era of SEC basketball as of the last decade, a lot more investment, a lot more competition. So, I don't know if you're one. I regardless, I have any super high expectations because they're going to be yeah. getting this whole thing figured out and what the hell is going on because the program has just been turned in such a horrible direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just being it, not even be, well this year with Missouri being so bad. It's Missouri and Vanderbilt are the two worst teams in the conference. Yeah, you're right. Nobody even has a debate about the fact that Missouri and Vanderbilt are the two worst teams in a not very good SEC. Yes, this year specifically. So, Byington, I'm bought in, but there's a lot of work to do. Mm-hmm. This yeah, is, definitely. This is a fixer-upper mm-hmm. of a program, yeah. if there ever was one. I, I think that's another quote I'm stealing from Chris Dorch. I want to keep shouting out that that yeah. interview Joey did, because it was an incredible interview. Really, really dug into what Byington is and what Byington's about. So, mm-hmm. hard to say specific expectations for me right now, but I think this is the right guy in a tough situation at Vanderbilt, man. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. I don't want to keep hitting on the same thing, but man, that cupboard is bare. Yeah. I will say the first game in Memorial, which I will be in attendance. I will. Hell, I might get season tickets to be honest. I might get season tickets. Um, that first game in Memorial, if they come out and they beat the hell who, out of whoever they're playing, I might say tournament team. I might. I don't know. Don't test Can me. Can you imagine the energy? On these episodes, if we had an actually competitive basketball team competing oh, for the spot for a spot in the field of sixty-eight, CBS would acquire this podcast. Oh, we don't even, <laughs> dude. I would quit my day job. We've had nothing 
it the energy we would love to bring to a successful program. God, dude. dude. The best, the most we have seen is two years ago with Vanderbilt basketball yes. when they made when they had like a 12 game run of being good and the energy was out of this world. Tailgates. Yes. Imagine imagine that energy times 10. Oh my God. Byington. Oh my God. Let's see what you got. Anything else you want to add on this episode 265? Coach Byington, come on the pod. Come on the pod. It's time to buy in. What if what if all of Vandy, uh, all of the TDR listeners, which we need a nickname for, um, just tweeted at him and say, hashtag go on the pod. The TD- what do you come on the pod? Hey. All right. Everyone out there. The yeah, t- there we go. The TDR tards. Let's go. Oh. <laughs> Let's go, baby. I didn't say it. Oh. I didn't say it fully, but we'll see if that <laughs> sticks. I think that's a good way to close out episode 265. For myself, Will Byram, and my co-host, Trevor Hewlin, this has been episode 265 of The Door Report, powered by 615 Collectibles.